Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Jacobs, and I am the director of the Center for Climate Adaptation Science and Solutions at the University of Arizona. Um, we are very happy to help support um, this event, which is the third in a series related to biodiversity of the Sky Islands. Um, this, uh, this workshop will be a um, very similar format to the two previous ones. Um, we're very pleased to have all of you join us. Um, so the way we will uh, proceed is after a couple of introductory remarks, I just wanna mention that uh, we will have the chat box open for your questions and answers. So please feel free to use that um, so that that material is available when it gets to the discussion period. Uh, we are recording this event. Um, so we just wanna make sure that everyone knows that's the case. Uh, we have a poll um, so that the participants can be, we can know a little bit more about who is on the line and what your interests are. So if that poll has been, there we go. Um, please note that it act, there's actually um, a scroll down feature, which I missed the last time. Um, so there's actually four questions. So feel free to go ahead and get those questions answered. And um, at the end of this, welcome will share the responses with you. So uh, this is the last in the three part series. So we wanted to um, share some thank yous. First of all, the Arizona Institutes for Resilience have provided um, most of the logistical support for this. And the names of the technical facilitators are at the bottom of this screen here. Uh, Lori Emler, Maggie Hurd, Amanda Leinberger, and Maya Patterson. Um, we thank them very much for their support. Um, there are a number of other participants and institutions that have helped support this effort, including the City College of New York, uh, the National Science Foundation, the Sky Island Alliance. And we in particular want to thank all of the speakers, facilitators, and participants um, that have been part of this program. The University of Arizona uh, occupies the original homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki Nations, indigenous peoples, who have stewarded, us the, stewarded this land since time immemorial. And we wanna make sure that we acknowledge that point. Uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about the Arizona Institutes for Resilience. This is a constellation of pre-existing programs and projects uh, that have come together uh, under the leadership of the University of Arizona. Our vision is to address the crises of climate and global change uh, head on and have the University of Arizona be the go-to place for students and faculty committed to managing climate and environmental risks and building equitable and effective solutions um, to these challenges. And our website is provided there. So uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, after this welcome, um, we will share the poll results and then we will, um, Paolo Padri will introduce the speakers um, three speaker presentations, and then a short question and answer session. Um, then there will be a 35 minute breakout, report outs, and then uh, takeaways and wrap ups and closing remarks. So that is the agenda for today. Um, today's discussion question is, what are the greatest biodiversity challenges to the conservation and management of Sky Island biodiversity? How do we prioritize research to address these challenges? So that's the main question you'll all be answering. Um, in terms of who is with us today, um, there it's pretty evenly split between students, early career professionals, and mid-late career. Um, and as with our previous ones, the vast majority of the participants are scientific um, academic researchers. Um, and in, I would say uh, there's actually more people from Mexico than from the US, which is fantastic, 40%, uh, um, that's fantastic. And then 28% work in both, so that's, that's interesting. And then finally, um, as far as primary study systems, uh, animals seem to be outnumbering plants two to one. Um, so it gives us a little bit more of a view of who's with us today. So I am going to close that um, and we can stop, sh stop sharing my screen and move on. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.
Kathy, and thanks again, everyone, for being here. Those of you that is the first time, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, uh, today is our last uh, webinar, and um, but I am really excited, and I apologize for the bias, but this is uh, the stuff that I that I enjoy the most. What, the kind of things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, not only the question, the main question that we have is extremely interesting from a conservation management perspective, of course. Uh, but um, I am also really excited of the because of the speakers that we have, because of the topics, because of the amazing work that the three of them actually have been doing. Um, so our first speaker is Alberto Burques. Um, Alberto Burques currently works at the Instituto de Ecología, this uh, grand a grand, great institution in Mexico at UNAM, at the Department of Ecology and Biodiversity um, uh, of UNAM. Alberto does research in ecology, evolutionary biology, and ethnoecology, and his current projects include um, columnar cacti, ecology and evolution, and so societal services, the effects of extreme events on vegetation, uh, and uh, drought and freezing resistance in your tropical plants at the edge distribution. Today, Alberto is going to talk about sapling mortality from hotter drought um, uh, at the threatening in pines in Mexico. And the, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see what he has to say. Mexico is, has the highest diversity of pines in the world, and um, I'm um, really looking forward to this. So without further ado, Alberto, welcome. Thanks so much for uh, being here today. Well, we, uh, today I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about uh, a joint project with the University of Arizona led by uh, David Brashears and Angelina Martinez and a group of enthusiastic researchers in Mexico and in the USA about sapling mortality, hotter droughts, and the pine forest outlook for mega Mexico tree. What you see, uh, the map you see in the screen uh, is the map of mega Mexico, uh, a country bigger than Mexico that includes parts of Central America and all the southern border of the USA. Uh, this map was delineated by Jerzy Rendowski, the foremost uh, researcher in botany in Mexico, uh, highly recognized uh, researcher, uh, and is based on floristic affinities. So this is, this is what a real map should look uh, like. <clears throat> Uh, this is the view uh, northeast from Sierra La Madera in northern Sonora. Uh, what we see are a series of peaks that uh, arise from the Sonoran desert vegetation and have different la layers of vegetation that go from Sonoran desert to oak grasslands and grasslands to woodlands to pine forest and then uh, uh, coniferous uh, forest with uh, uh, short-lived uh, trees. And uh, here is a whole collection of the most important uh, uh, sky islands we have in northwestern Sonora and the southwestern, southeastern Arizona, sorry. That include Los Ajos, the Chiricahuas, Sierra Azul, La Mariquita, Los Pinitos, La Madera, uh, and then on the left side, we can see the, the Santa Catalina Mountains and the Rincon, and in the back, the Pinaleño, and behind those, the White Mountains, uh, next with the Huachuca and the Chiricahuas. By the way, Pinaleño uh, and Pinal County means pines, places where pines are common. <clears throat> so this is the usual view of the Madrean uh, Sky Islands. But if we go southwards, uh, south of Hermosillo. There are much lower mountains, but still very complex. Uh, three new plants communities appear. The coastal thorn scrub, close, very close to the sea in a very narrow band. Uh, then uh, we have the Sonoran Desert, the foothills thorn scrub, that is mainly tropical species that are in the subtropical zone. Uh, and above that, uh, the dry tropical forest uh, that inter intermingles with the oak uh, uh, grasslands and oak woodlands. A thing that we do not find in the northernmost uh, sky islands. <clears throat> and if we go farther south, the, like 20 degrees north, uh, well within the tropics in the Sierra Manantlan, uh, 
there are uh, uh, vegetation uh, sections that are lost. The Sonora Desert completely disappears. The coastal forest crop is still present. The tropical dry forest uh, st starts right from the sea upwards, and then we have cloud forests, uh, and then the, the usual oak woodlands, pine oak forest, coniferous forest, and so on. And if you look carefully, you will see that the the wood the oak woodlands upwards, all these levels remain about the same ele elevation, while down from from uh, the oak woodlands you find. A, a, a jumble of different uh, vegetation types that just change latitudinally. And this is because, and as Hela will explain in her talk, uh, because it's mainly related to the uh, freezing uh, uh, isotherm, in which that, 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 that will uh, put a limit to the expansion of uh, tropical vegetation. <clears throat> So almost half of the world pine trees are found in Mexico. Tropical and subtropical mountains of Mexico have the largest diversity of pine trees of the world. There are 49 species or about, out of the about 110 uh, species of the world. So half of the diversity of pine trees is in Mexico. And uh, the, <laughs> many of the rest are in California. And the same applies to oaks, by the way. Uh, and the Madrean Sky Islands are uh, a unique set of mountains that are in between these two areas, between the, the, the mainland uh, uh, ranges of, of Mexico and California. Uh, and forest persistence may be uh, at greatest risk along a steep gradient of elevations where seedling and sapling mortality do to a predicted hotter drought could drive long-term species range, range uh, uh, contractions. These are pictures from Manantlan. Uh, well, in 1977, Peter Grob, that was the advisor of Dr. Martinez, by the way, introduced the regeneration niche concept. A plant species cannot persist if the environmental conditions are only suitable for adults and not for production of fruits, seeds, germination, and seedling, and seedling and sapling establishment. And for regeneration, pine forests rely on the ability of these very early stages of life to tolerate hotter droughts. And model projections assessing impacts of hotter droughts supported by drought by temperature experiments are lacking. There are very, very few experiments showing experimentally how these saplings can withstand uh, drought and heat. And of course, of particular concern are regions that are composed of these steep gradients associated with the Sky Islands. <clears throat> so we decided to test experimentally how hotter drought saplings of uh, Mexican uh, uh, pine species could withstand drought and, and higher temperatures predicted in the future. And uh, to do so, uh, Dave Brashears invited us to, 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 to start in this uh, venture. Uh, and we set up uh, uh, greenhouses with the base temperature cycle of summer uh, in the Sierra Madre Occidental, in the fourth summer, by the way, before the rains. Uh, and uh, uh, the base temperature plus four degrees as predicted by the RCPA 8.5 of the IPCC. So we had a base temperature and a hotter temperature greenhouse, the same cycles. And uh, uh, we grew these five species. And uh, uh, in the top map, you can see the distribution of these five species in red, where only one species can be found, in green, two species, and in blue, these uh, hot spots of find diversity throughout uh, mega Mexico. Here and there in Nayarit, uh, in central Mexico near uh, uh, the northern uh, uh, ranges of Puebla, uh, and then somewhere in Oaxaca and so on. And this distribution of pine trees coincides very well with the major ranges in Mexico. The only exception, of course, is the southern Mexican plateau, that is a very high plateau, that is very arid, uh, 
uh, and of course there are no pine trees there because of the of rain shadow effect. So uh, I am, we are showing only two of the five figures here uh, in which we uh, tested these five species and we found that if we watered the plants, there was a 100% survival in the base chamber. So if we kept watering the plants throughout the experiment, all the species survived in the base chamber, but not uh, even watering, uh, not all of them survived in the uh, hotter uh, greenhouse. Some of the species have losses, not, not large, but some losses. The experiment lasted 60 days, days to reach 100% mortality of all species. And uh, we found differences between six and 17 days between survival chips in the base and the hotter chamber for all the species. <clears throat> and they are, those are the, the, the survival curves. In red, the hotter, in blue, the base chambers for, for uh, individuals that were not watered throughout the experiment. <clears throat> So we found also that some species were more resistant, resistant than, than, than others. Uh, and in the, in the image, uh, we are showing uh, the, me the median times of survival for a typical plant subjected to a hotter drought for each of the species. So some species last longer than others. For example, stroviformes and, 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 and pseudostrobes are the ones that last longer and Montezuma and Engelmanni are the ones that do not last for, for, for a long time until death. <clears throat> uh, then uh, knowing that, knowing that, that uh, hotter droughts really uh, subject plants to uh, intensive stress leading to mortality under hotter droughts, we use the thermodynamics of dry adiabatic uh, lapse rate projections to bound the species distribution in elevation on their hotter drought in Mega Mexico 3. And we assume that, that uh, uh, the conditions were the RCP85 leading to higher episodic droughts by temperature events, that the only change in the actual species distribution was a change in elevation, not, not, not in latitude, or uh, there was no chance to, to disperse because of the short time scale. <clears throat> and that only abiotic filtering was occurring. So we were not considering the biotic interactions, for example, the Norse plant effects. <clears throat> and what we found is that, is that there were great losses ranging from 35 to 55% uh, in the distribution of all five species studied. And in four of the five species, the five, the, the, the net, sorry, the net distribution losses in terms of for, uh, surface area, we're between 30 and 50%. So we are losing very large chunks of forest, uh, uh, given uh, uh, an increasing uh, drought by temperature uh, events. And the gains and losses are not especially similar among the species. Pinus Engelmani, I have extensive gains southward <clears throat> of the mean latitude and losses in the northern reaches of distribution. While Pinus strobiformis shows a great reduction in its southern distribution, gaining a small foothold in the in Rocky Mountains. These are unpublished data, and please don't do not reproduce outside of this <clears throat> uh, conference. So <clears throat> the third uh, test we wanted to do was to see if the predictions derived from the experimental base, the bounding projections. Uh, really were uh, related to elevation. Uh, that means uh, higher ele elevation species will lose a greater portion of uh, surface and surely it happened. Say, uh, uh, Pinus Engelmanii, the lowest elevation uh, species in terms of the centroid distribution, uh, have a much uh, smaller loss than Stroviformis or Montezuma that were the highest elevation species. So higher elevation species do uh, loss uh, uh, a much higher share of their uh, surface area. <clears throat> uh, 
So we conclude that adult tree mortality has been documented elsewhere, but uh, the future of forest persistence depends on, uh, sap on the survival of saplings. Uh, and little research has been done on seedling and sapling, sapling survival under hotter drought. Uh, and all the fiber species respond uh, to hotter droughts. They, there is there's an increase mortality, uh, and some species are more sensitive than others. Uh, the increasingly frequent hotter droughts events are now occurring, and these have a strong effect on the regeneration niche of saplings, probably stronger than on adult trees. We can see the forest, but we will not see the saplings, <clears throat> suggesting <clears throat> that in a business as usual scenario, the study of the species will show a die off affecting between 35 and 55 percent of their broad distribution. Uh, four of the five, five species have net losses amounting from 30 to 50 percent, and local growth extinctions are likely to occur for some species, particularly those in low elevation. Sky islands where upward migration cannot occur because they're not very tall, uh, uh, will suffer a lot from that. As a result of ongoing and projected adult tree mortality, shorter uh, and a smaller stature forest, if any forest, will be, will, will be the future. Our results reveal substantial threats to longer term forest persistence across mega Mexico while also uh, in conjunction with other studies, reveal high risks for pinus forests, and probably oaks and other high elevation species. Uh, <clears throat> and broadly, our results illustrate how mortality of earlier life stage, such as saplings, not just the saddles, drives regional risks of forest persistence. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. That was that was amazing. Thanks so much for um, for your presentation. Uh, we do have a question already from uh, Dakota Rossi. Um, have you considered testing the association between elevational range for each species and net percentage of loss as a means of establishing whether elevational specialists, um, if such a term applies for these five species, are more impacted than elevational generalists? No, but that, would, that, that could be a, a, a great uh, <clears throat> uh, project. We need uh, uh, postdocs and, 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 uh, and uh, graduate students to, to, to start testing this. this, this. Because when, when you have a, a good project, many new uh, questions arise. If you have a bad project, it ends and that's it. But this project has uh, uh, brought many, many new questions that uh, are worth exploring. Um, well, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I do have a quick question, Alberto. So in, in the early slides, you show that it was uh, the Chihuahua white pine, the strobiformis that actually resisted the longest time without, uh, without being water, right? Am I correct? And that is, they, is uh, the white pine. Yeah. But still, though, but that's the one that showed the, the greatest uh, um, losses in cover. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, well, <clears throat> I don't know if there's, a, I'm just uh, scrolling to we, the we, chat. We, 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 <clears throat> we, have, we uh, uh, develop a resistance uh, evaluation for each of the species. Mm -hmm. And some species are more resistant than others. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is what are you referring to? Uh, there are differences in resistance. And uh, in, a, in a future experiment, we will try to measure resilience. And resilience can be measured by watering once you reach the median uh, point for, for your uh, experimental population. See, see if, you, if you rewater, see how many of those uh, can rebound and 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 uh, uh, be brought back from from the dead. 
Yeah. Um, what about, Alicia is asking, what about population-based differences within species? Can you elaborate more on that, on that question? Uh, I think Alicia is just asking about uh, what the, the differences within the species based on, on the populations or like, or me, perhaps meta populations. Yeah. But maybe I can explain it. Uh, speaking. Yeah. So my question is, and I arrived a little bit late, so sorry if you say this earlier in your talk, but how did you choose the trees that were used in the experiments to represent the species as a whole? Because as you say, the, some of these species have fragmented uh, distributions, which means that one population might act differently than the other in terms of its resistance to drought? Or do you think this is a trait which is fixed at the species level and there will not be differences among populations? Very little research has been done on that. Uh, it's most likely that there are, there are strong the, the differentiation along uh, latitudinal and, and elevational gradients for all the species. What we had were uh, single source uh, uh, collections from, uh, from, for each of the species. For example, for Pidus gregii, that is a, a, a rather limited distribution of species, uh, I, I think uh, the population we had was the northern one. Uh, for Engelmanii, was where there were populations of the on the northern side of the of the mountains near Cananea, I think. And uh, uh, for Strobiformis, uh, that there is a lot of uh, discussion about separating into Ayacahuite and, and Strobiformis. Uh, I think we had a northern population too. Uh, but that will be uh, the, the 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 core of this of this uh, experimental design is is just trying to uh, explore the the resistance of of uh, different species uh, the functional uh, response to hotter drought uh, and of course there will be. Uh, Define, define differences once you start separating populations. And I am sure there is a lot of genetic differentiation uh, along the Sierra ranges because of uh, uh, abiotic uh, processes related to latitude. Uh, I don't think there is there are effects of gene flow, uh, but uh, certainly there will be uh, some growths that, are, uh, uh, that have local adaptation uh, along uh, different uh, elevational levels. Uh, I think you are, you are going along, along these lines, uh, Alicia. Yeah, exactly. So okay. I remember an experiment with Avis religiosa where populations were very different in terms of their resistance to drought. So something to take in mind. Thank you. Yes, my, my former student, Sebastian Arenas, is, is working on on obvious uh, uh, populations in central Mexico now. Uh, Actually, I'm in his committee. The world is yeah, very small. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Let's uh, so we have a couple more things. Maybe we can speed it up a little bit. So Tim uh, Burnett is asking, what about pin, a pine uh, beetle infestation? Um, and then uh, Chancellor McDonald is asking, uh, just curious about the link between experimental setup and natural conditions. How many days are the average and extreme drought periods in, this, in these areas? Uh, this is a, a very important uh, question, uh, uh, particularly regarding the, the length of the of, of drought. Uh, so the difference between resisting uh, uh, an extreme uh, drought by temperature event uh, with high mortality is between six and 17 days. And uh, this is very likely to happen, say, at the lowermost uh, distribution yeah. of, of each of the species. I don't know if they can, 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 would like to, to elaborate more on, the, on this question. I, I'll, I'll just say very briefly that um, in, t in terms of the bark beetle part, it, it, it will probably, make things more, you know, more um, worse than it is now. And in terms of the, and worse th than what we've estimated just using drought and heat. 
So we've, we've done conservative estimates of how fast they will die. And then relative to uh, the drought frequency, um, we've, we've sort of assumed in these experiments a single drought. The plant started wet and then, the, then it was a protracted drought. And that distribution of drought frequency is curvilinear so that there's much more long droughts than short droughts. I, uh, I'm sorry, much more, much more short droughts than long droughts. And consequently, if trees die faster, there's a nonlinear increase in lethal droughts. So anyway, it just, it just uh, doesn't answer the question of the exact uh, drought distribution, but drought distributions are nonlinear with lots of short ones and a few long ones. And that influences the, lethal, the number of lethal events. Thank you, everybody, for your questions and your answers. Um, I think we need to keep moving. Uh, and so now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Merrick. Uh, Melissa is an associate director of uh, recovery ecology for the Southwest Hub at the San Diego Sioux Wildlife Alliance and an adjunct assistant research professor at the University of Arizona. Her research primarily focuses on the ecology of vertebrates and of conservation concern. She incorporates natural history, population dynamics, space use, habitat selection, behavioral ecology, and landscape connectivity to understand how animals respond to their environment, uh, including impacts of disturbance and invasions. Um, Melissa, welcome. I think a lot of your work is, happens in the, uh, the Pinaleños, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and I was just camping there a few weeks ago and it's uh, such a wonderful place. So, well, <laughs> welcome, Melissa, and uh, thanks. Uh, gracias, Paolo, for the introduction. Uh, bienvenidos a todo. It's a placer estoy con ustedes hoy día. Um, and so I am going to build upon the wonderful outline that Alberto already laid out for us, talking about the forests of the Sky Islands and the unique biodiversity of forests. But I'm going to look at it from the perspective of some of the tree squirrels that depend on the forests. Uh, for persistence, and some of them are, are endemic and unique as well. So that is why I think of them as little jewels or treasures of the of the Sky Island uh, province. And so I'm going to be talking about some squirrels in the Madrean archipelago and, and then look a little beyond that. So one of the reasons why studying tree squirrels is so interesting is because it's extremely long co-evolutionary history with uh, forests in which they depend. So tree squirrel lineages are over 38 million years old. So this is a picture of a fossilized uh, skeleton of a 38 year old, a 38 million year old um, tree squirrel. And as you can see, they really haven't changed at all in form and function. And so this really just outlines that this is a successful plan. And if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, they've been doing quite well and they have been evolving with their unique forest ecosystems for a long, long time. And so not surprisingly, uh, tree squirrel uh, life history and natural history dynamics and a lot of behavioral traits and foraging ecology are really closely tied to the same traits uh, in forests. For example, uh, we were working with colleagues in the Italian Alps. We studied uh, uh, two ecologically similar tree squirrels, the Eurasian red squirrel, on the left here and the Mount Graham red squirrel on the right. Both depend on mixed conifer to spruce, spruce species in, in forests. But what we found was that the phenology or the timing of the resource pulses in these different forest ecosystems really drove extremely divergent uh, life history traits, including uh, differences in foraging ecology, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? <laughs> Space use patterns and social di and social systems. So in the Italian Alps, Norway spruce is a, is stays on the tree for a long time. It's not as pulsed of a resource, and therefore Eurasian red squirrels are are, are social. They have overlapping home ranges and they uh, scatter hoard their food. And in contrast, in the forests of the western of the uh, 
Rocky Mountains in Western North America, red squirrels depend on spruce forests that are often dominated by um, Engelmann spruce or black spruce or some other forms of spruce that have very pulsed resources that the cones do not stay on the trees very long before they open and release their seeds. Therefore, there's very limited ephemeral resource pulses, which has driven the red squirrel lineage in North America to be uh, larger hoarders and very territorial non-overlapping home ranges and not very social. And forests, uh, forests and squirrels, another really unique feature is the ecosystem services that squirrels provide to, for to forests. And so squirrels are incredibly good at seed dispersing and they also consume lots of uh, fun fun fungi, which uh, are, and then they disperse their spores, which are, and so this, they are also important dispersers of fungal spores. Many of these fungal uh, species have important mycorrhizal associations, which some of these conifer species are really dependent upon for nutrient uptake. And so it begs the question, if you know, forests, what is a forest without a without these squirrels? How, how well do the squirrels or do the forests do? Um, and, you know, that's just another component of something to consider when we're thinking about these, you know, persistence and conservation of, of forests and the species that depend on them. Uh, squirrels are also really unique uh, systems in which to test some of these biogeographic patterns because their distribution both uh, and their genetic structure reflect cycles of, bio, of past glaciations and forest community change. So we can use them to test some of these biogeographic theories um, and then uh, as, as you know, looking in conservation perspectives, uh, they are really used uh, worldwide as can be indicators of forest ecosystem health and integrity. So as we've talked about uh, already with Alberto so nicely light outlined for us, this, you know, the Sky Island province um, here in North America is very unique. It's full of, bi it's a biodiversity hotspot for plants, animals, and in, uh, across the board. Um, and not surprisingly here in this region, we also have three unique taxonomic groups of tree squirrels. So let me get my laser pointer on. So we have, you know, here, here are the Pinaleños, which is uh, the home to the Mount Graham red squirrel, which marks the southernmost distribution of the North American red squirrel species complex. Uh, we have Arizona gray squirrels that are isolated on some of these mountain ranges in southern Arizona. And then we have the Chiricahua fox squirrel, which is a subspecies of the, the uh, Mexican fox squirrel, Cyrus nayaritensis. Uh, which is endemic to the Chiricahua Mountains. And uh, so these, these squirrels are, you know, tightly dependent on some of these unique forest ecosystems, which themselves are very, are very threatened. And just to highlight something that we talked about last session of the importance of understanding the genetic diversity of some of these uh, island uh, endemics or some of these populations that have been isolated for a really long time, a recent revision of the genus Tamia sciurus, which is with what the North American red squirrel group is subsumed into, um, showed that actually here in the Southwest, we do have a unique new species, which is now being called Tamia sciurus fremonti, for which the Mount Graham red squirrel shown here is part of that new species. So there probably are a lot more of these cryptic species of conservation concern in this, in this unique region than we, we even know about. And, and so in the, so today what I'm going to focus on are a couple different uh, examples, uh, locations and talk about some of the threats to the forest and the squirrels that depend on them. I'm going to focus on the Pinaleño and the Chiricahua Mountains shown here in orange as some of the examples of some of the threats and conservation concerns. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a stranger in the genus, this little guy down here, the Mirza squirrel, which is endemic to the Sierra San Pedro Martir in Baja California Norte, um, as a kind of an example of something we might be looked to to see how squirrels might deal with future forest changes in light of climate change. So we know that one of the biggest stressors to forests in this region are increasing uh, intensity, frequency, and, and severity of disturbance events, including, including fire. And this, I think, is one of the biggest conservation concerns that are facing uh, forests in this, in this region currently. 
And as Alberto line, outlined before, we are facing this, this threshold um, upon which we are not sure if, um, if species can recover from. So here is an example, the, the Pinalenos here and the Chiricavas here, you can see these are uh, compiled burn severity um, and burn polygons for uh, fire polygons for the last couple of decades. And really both of these mountain ranges have burned completely, almost entirely have experienced fire of different severities. And so what we're seeing right now is we have, you know, we have this, you know, previous without, without these like intense disturbances, which include uh, climate change, drought, stress, drought stress, trees are more susceptible to insect colonization and defoliation and death. And then we get these widespread severe fires. And so we have a situation where in the past, the threshold to go to a different forest community state or non-forest state was much higher than it is now. So it doesn't take as much to push these forests in, over the edge into a novel uh, forest ecosystem or maybe not even any forests at all. And so what is really concerning is what's, what are these forests going to come back as after fire? And this box just shows like this is the past disturbance regime, which the evolutionary, the niche of the forests were within those realms, the forests that have, and species within them have evolved to experience this, this type of severity, size and frequency of disturbance events. But now we're seeing that those are far outside of what uh, species, both forests and squirrels are adapted to deal with. So just an example, look at the Chiricahuas here first. And so what we're, what, what we have here is this really unique uh, pine, oak, juniper woodlands that were mature um, and um, that the, the Chiricahua fox squirrel is really dependent on these for, for nest sites. And the, the Chiricahua mountains have experienced many different fires, most recently a uh, 2011 Horseshoe 2 fire. And uh, what we're seeing is post fire, the, the, the trees that are, are, are are regenerating our only oak. And this is a work looking at the difference in recruitment of pinus versus oak species over the last couple of decades. And what we're really seeing is lots of recruitment of, of oaks uh, coming back in these short multi-stemmed um, fire, you know, post-fire oaks uh, stature um, and almost no recruitment of pinus, just like Alberto was talking about. And in Chiricahua National Monument, we've been surveying all, over 300 historic sites that Chiricahua fox squirrels used to be very common at. And so far we have not found any, which um, is indicating that, you know, this, this, at least in Chiricahua National Monument is no longer um, suitable habitat for, for this uh, subspecies anymore. And so next I'm going to move to the Pinaleños, which are experiencing um, similar disturbance cascades right before our eyes. So previously, this is um, in the early 90s, the Pinaleño forest used to be a beautiful mix of mixed conifer and the southernmost distribution of uh, Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir uh, here at the top in, in North America. And over time, it has been hit with insect uh, defoliation and tree death, followed by multiple fires. And then now, if you fly over the Pinaleños, this is the remnant patch of spruce fir forest that remains. And this is, you know, this, this is changing the microclimate um, for regeneration of new uh, saplings. And so we don't know what species will return to these, uh, to these forests that have been impacted so severely by all these disturbances, if any, you know, conifers will return at all. And this is really important for the conservation of red squirrels in particular because their ecology is so unique. So red squirrels, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, larder hoarders, which means they collect cones from around their territories and actually store them in one place. And so they rely or they select these cool, moist microclimates in which to store cones. So that prevents the cones from opening and releasing their seeds. And so what we find is that after squirrels have, you know, built up a huge store of cones, 
they sit and eat them in one place and they create these piles of cone scales, which are essentially their refrigerator. And so this, they rely on these cool, moist microclimates in which to keep the cones closed. And they dig pits in the, in the middens um, to bury the cones, to preserve them even longer over winter. And it also buffers them against uh, the next year that may not have and many cones available. It may not be a mast year. And so this is something that's very unique to squirrels in the genus Tamiocyrus, both North American red squirrels and uh, Douglas squirrels. But what is the likelihood that middens are going to serve any adaptive value or whether they can persist at all when fire, the forest now looks like this? It's more open and dry. We're not sure if those cool, moist microclimates will, will, will persist into the future. And you know, we don't know how squirrels were, you know, that are adapted to, to their life history is adapted to forests of a certain condition, how they will deal with these changes. And so one thing that we see is, that's hopeful is that we know that squirrels are very resourceful and resilient, and they're really just trying to make a living any way they can. Um, and, you know, they're, they're certainly not trying to die, um, roll over and die. And so, you know, here we have examples of Mount Graham red squirrels after the fire, you know, they're storing cones in root holes that were left from the, from the, from the fire where a tree snag used to be. And, you know, they, they're, they're still kicking, they're still living and, and trying to make a living the best that they can. So, um, you know, there is some hope there that, but we don't know if they, if the forest is changing faster than they will be able to keep, uh, keep pace with. And so I'm going to show you another example of uh, sort of a cousin of the Mount Graham red squirrel that might offer us some clues of what, what might happen in the future. So the Miramsa squirrel is a subspecies of Douglas squirrel that has been isolated since at least the Pleistocene in the Sierra San Pedro Martir in Baja California Norte here. Um, and really little had been known about it until um, a PhD student, Nicolas Ramos Lara, uh, went there to do his dissertation research on the ecology of Mirnsa squirrel in the Parque Nacional Sierra San Pedro Martir. And um, so he found some really cool things. This, and he always calls the Mirnsa squirrel the stranger in the genus because it's, it was full of so many surprises. So here in the Sierra San Pedro Martir, the forest is very open and dry um, with a lot of these unique uh, different pine species, including sugar pine and Jeffrey pine. And um, what Nicolas was expecting was that the squirrels here would also build middens because that's what Douglas's squirrels do. But what he found was that uh, the Mirnsa squirrel uh, did not create middens at all. They are scatter hoarders. Um, they they uh, do not have middens, they don't larder hoard, they're non-territorial, they have overlapping home ranges. And interestingly, their cranial morphology is unique. It's a little bit larger with larger uh, musculature in their jaw muscles. He hypothesizes that that could be because they are working with a much larger cone. Some of these cones are even bigger than Southwestern white pine. They're bigger than the body of the squirrel. Um, and he also found, um, that, let's see, I can't, you know, he found that they were just unique in lots of different ways. Um, and um, the, the, that was, you know, maybe this offers some clue as to what we might be looking towards for some of these uh, red squirrel or squirrels, especially red squirrels in the Sky Islands that are facing these different uh, rapid, rapidly changing forest ecosystems. Will Will they be able to adapt and go to a non-admitted lifestyle or are the forests changing too fast for them to, to keep up with that? So this offers lots of uh, some hope, but also some conservation challenges that we're really going to have to think carefully about restoration and this post-fire regeneration niche and think much past the lifetime of our own human lives and thinking about you know, what the forest will come back as and how can we maintain at least resiliency in some form to promote the persistence of these uh, endemic species, uh, lots of different uh, small mammals, including uh, red squirrels and other squirrels in the Sky Island region.
So with that, gracias a todos. Um, I appreciate your attention and I will stop sharing and take questions. Muchas gracias, Melissa. Um, really, really interesting um, stuff here. And yes, like really well connected to uh, Alberto's uh, questions and challenges earlier. Um, so yeah, we have a question from uh, Lori. Uh, if you have, oh no, <laughs> sorry, that's a call. <laughs> Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or you can also just jump in uh, right now while you get the courage needed. I just want to remind uh, que a, los, uh, a todos los que hablan español, si desean ser asignados a un grupo de discusión en español, por favor envíen un mensaje en privado a Maggie Hurt diciendo sí. Um, well, I... Melissa, I, one of the first, you know, as you were showing the engineering efforts of threat squirrels in Mount Graham, I, I was wondering, is there, are you aware, is there any effort that we could do, you know, in, on the ground to support the, the, the efforts of red squirrels to actually keep engineering the, the ecosystem in the way they've been doing it? Is, uh, is that something that can be done? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that we, have been grappling with or trying to think about. Um, we know that red squirrels tend to be associated with some of, you know, some of these old growth characteristics, which include some down woody debris. Um, they like to construct those scale piles along uh, log piles or, you know, where there's more um, dense, where the trees are more dense. Um, but that causes challenges for fire prevention. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the forest people for managing the forest, they want to remove the woody debris. Um, and so, uh, so those are some management challenges. And one question we had is if we create artificial structures and mm -hmm. so say put wood chips in them or even just create log piles, will that promote um, the recruitment of squirrels to those sites? But the challenge is because it is a federally endangered uh, subspecies, one question we have is, will that become an ecological trap where we bring squirrels to this site that isn't actually going to promote their survival? They will settle there because the queues are there, but um, maybe the microclimate isn't right or it's too open and it makes them more susceptible to predation, which is already really, really high. Um, so we are trying to be very cautious with that and trying to kind of answer some of these questions in a non-endangered population in the White Mountains. Okay, yeah, that, yeah that, that's a challenge for sure. Thank you. We have a question from Dakota Rossi. Uh, oh no, sorry, first for David, David Henry. Uh, do you have an idea from uh, phylogenetics slash paleoecology of how long ago Mern squirrel diverged from other Douglas squirrel populations? Well, I, I don't have the paper in front of me, but that, that paper by Andrew Hope et al. in Molecular Ecology and, and Phylogenetics uh, 2016, um, he, he just recently did the whole genetic revision of the Temisayuris, and he put Mirza squirrel back into Douglas. Um, so it was a, it, previously it was thought of as a, as, as a different species, but now it is, it is put back in with Douglas squirrels. And, and I think that he shows some of the, the phylogenies with divergence timelines in that paper, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Thanks. Uh, thank you. There's a comment from um, Dakota about, you know, the, the dramatic change in the 30 years in the Pinalenos. And yes, I agree, um, even though I didn't know them before. Uh, Chancy, Melissa, fascinating. Uh, you spoke about potential thresholds, uh, threshold effects. Does the team plan to investigate these? If so, what are some of your potential methodologies? Well, the Forest Service, that's a great question. And the Forest Service is, is and, and colleagues from the University of Arizona, I know Don Falk's lab has looked at um, the historical distribution of different tree species in the Pinaleños looking based on tree touring cores. Um, and looking at, you know, where there might be some, um, some refugia for some of these species on the mountain as well. Um, but one of the things that we're finding is the recruitment of some, some of the species is, is very low. And so the Forest Service has been planting, um, they started with planting Engelman spruce in the upper elevations, but um, as Alberta pointed out, they were not surviving very well. Um, because the microclimate there was now open and dry, 
and very, um, they were very stressed. And so what they're, what they're doing, and they even took seed stock from the Pinaleños, grew them in Boise, uh, somewhere in Idaho, brought them back as seedlings and planted them. But now they're thinking more um, about this post-fire regeneration niche and starting with more um, adapted species. So they're, they're starting with like say Douglas fir and white pine and then their future plan is to go in and start planting the spruce after those other trees become established. If I'm remember, remembering this correctly and, and, and Dawn or Dave, somebody that's maybe more familiar could, could chime in if I'm getting this wrong. Um, uh, Robbie was asking, can grazing other management strategies reduce fire intensity and how does grazing vary between the US and Mexico? Uh, and actually, I, I wanted to ask also Melissa about uh, the Rincon Mountains, which I, you know, they're known to have a very different fire regime just because of uh, access to them. And I don't know if there are some some insights that you can uh, tell us about. Between the U.S. and Mexico? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess the question is more around the, whether, you know, grazing and other management strategies to reduce fire intensity that, that you know have, may be happening there. Well, I think that there's, yeah, the history of, of like fire prevention in the in the US on the US side has has caused some of the problems that we're having with with in you know increased uh, large and more severe fires because there's just so much woody standing woody biomass um, because fires have been suppressed for so long and i think um, in the in mexico that is and some please correct me if i'm wrong i don't think that that is as much the case if fire suppression was was not as intense uh, over the last hundred years in Mexico. Yeah, there, I, I think there's less, certainly less less of a fire suppression history on the Mexican side in, in general. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, we need to keep moving. Um, there's another question. Just uh, I think this is might be quick. Uh, whether what the predators of the red squirrel are goshawks or what is what is predating on them? So the Sky Islands are, are hotspots of biodiversity for avian predators as well. So yeah, the Pinilenios are home to not only goshawks, but Cooper's hawks, sharp-shinned hawks, Mexican spotted owl, great horn owl, uh, long-eared owls, bobcats, and foxes are the things that we see uh, predate uh, red squirrels the most. So um, they have a lot of things trying to eat them as well. Yeah, that's that might be tough. That's some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, moving on. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Thanks very much. Um, so we have now uh, Angelina Martinez Irizar. Uh, Angelina is a researcher at the Instituto uh, Instituto de Ecología uh, uh, of uh, of UNAM, um, and her research interests have centered in understanding the structure and functioning biomass, primary productivity, litter decomposition, and nutrient cycling of water-limited ecosystems in Mexico. She also studies the effect of ecosystem response to extreme climatic events like frost, and drought, and hurricanes, and the vulnerability of ecosystems to land use and climate change. So uh, it's perfect talk, perfect topic to close today and, uh, and our uh, series. So welcome, Angelina. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Paulo. And I want to thank the organizers for having me here today to share with you this talk, that is the last of the sessions, that I entitled Resilience of Ecosystems to Extreme Climatic Events from ongoing research together with my colleagues and uh, colleagues and students in my lab from UNAM and Itson. Let me see how I pass to the next one. Here, right? Here. I will start using this Alberto's slide from his talk just to show that moving further south in Western Mexico, tropical dry forests occupy a much wider uh, band uh, below about 3,000 feet, mil kilometers, uh, mil, mil metros in elevation. And uh, they are there as well, affected by global warming as all of the mountain on the top and responding to what is happening above. So they go from 1,000 meters down to the coast. Snow and freezing temperatures are frequent in mountain systems, and you all know very well, and these pictures are, you are very familiar with. 
Uh, indeed, because of the orography, the number of days with minimum temperatures below freezing every year are present almost throughout Mexico. And the higher number, as you can see in this map from Conagua, in the peak of the mountains, mainly in the Sierra Madre Occidental with the highest elevation of all. In the frost-free areas and under a strong rainfall seasonality, the tropical dry forests indicated here in green are the dominant vegetation type and they go from 20 degrees north subtropical to down to the 16 degrees north. So they expand a lot of Mexico. And they are an important vegetation type because of their high biodiversity and number of endemic species. And unfortunately, not, very, not, not too much protected and highly affected by land use change. So in the northern uh, part of the distribution of the tropical dry forests here in, in, in Sonora, about 20 degrees north, freezing temperatures are associated to cold fronts. And as you can see in this map on the left, on the right, sorry, this was in 2011, we had experienced a, a, a cold front that was really uh, went down into Mexico, affecting all of the north of Mexico, causing awful losses because of agricultural loss, but nobody paid attention to the native vegetation. So we were working in the Alamos Rio Cuchujaki Reserve, where there the, the temperatures experienced were about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, minus four, five Celsius, and they were lasting for four days. So in this case, the, the, not only the, the lowest temperature, but the duration of the temperature caused extensive mortality in the forest. And this was the most severe event in the last 70 years. So by looking at the effect of this frost, we selected a 20 by 28 kilometer plot in which we survey 101 sites for presence or absence of frost-induced mortality, these sites were not uh, especially autocorrelated. We also uh, recorded uh, topographic variables, the condition of the forest, and in selected sites, like about 50, we measure a total of 26,000 stems, leaf and dead, measure the girth, identify, and identify the species and their condition. So this was this is a view of this forest in the in the Alamos region, and this uh, first uh, slide is the uh, photograph is during the wet season, and then this is how it looked right after the the frost with visible effect across the whole landscape. So there was extensive frost induced mortality, and the effect is persistent until today. So you go to the forest and you see all the standing dead leaves, uh, dead trees there. So there was a rapid alteration of the tropical dry forest ecosystem structure and function that is why I study. And considering the role of elevation on temperature redistribution during the advective freezes like this one, that means that heavier cold air masses move down the hill we expected that the probability of frost-induced immortality to be higher at lower elevations. So we analyzed the effect of the key local factors, elevation and slope aspect, on frost-induced frost immortality patterns using an, an observational and modeling approach. We also analyzed the relationship between the probability of occurrence of frost-induced immortality across the landscape and frost disturbance severity measure as density of the individuals to examine if such probabilities could be used to predict severity of damage across the landscape. So what we found that, that is that severity varied across the landscape. And in this map, we show the probability of occurrence of frost-induced tree mortality as predicted by, by one of our, uh, this model that we developed here, and we tried different models with different variables. This was the simple and the, uh, with, with uh, excellent fit. And the details of the model develop, the, how we developed these models and the validation and all the runs we made were published, they are in this publication in, in Global Change Biology. So what we found is that the, there is a threshold below which frost-induced tree mortality is likely to occur regardless of a slope aspect, 
and forest condition. That was about this line, 600 meters in elevation. Sorry, I don't have in feet, but should be 300, oh my God. <laughs> okay, the correlation between the predicted probability occurrence of tree mortality and the density of dead individuals, that is the severity of the damage, was highly significant in these two areas in which the sites have concave terrain which traps cold error, increasing disturbance severity. So that means that all other aspects of the morphology of the, of the terrain are important in modulating the effect of these disturbances. Well, we use NDVI anomaly as a measure of canopy loss, of canopy loss and what we did was to compare the long-term NDVI signal for a period of 12 years, pre-disturbance conditions, and we compared that image with this one that what, what this was just after the frost during the growing season. And we did a, a, a selection of images that were clear and that were uh, accurate, etc. So the anomaly is just the differences between these two images. And what we found, and you can see here, as the 8% the of the total study area had negative values, mainly in the middle elevations. Also, we uh, relate the anomalies with the number or the abundance of frost-killed individuals. And we found also a negative correlation between that so that we, could, we were able to predict well the severity of mortality. Finally, resprouting, which is, is a typical response of uh, these TDF trees to damage, was negatively correlated with NTD anomaly, as you can see in this graph below, also predicting very well frost-induced damage in the native forest. So the 2011 frost was an extreme event that caused an extreme and immediate impact on the northern limit of distribution of the TDF. This was confirmed by the abrupt change and extension of negative NTDF NTVI anomalies across the landscape and the associated high severity values that we observe. So we conclude that extreme frost events likely maintain and could ultimately shift the altitudinal and latitudinal range margins of the tropical dry forests. I will move a little bit further down in latitude to show a different extreme event that caused unprecedented alteration to the tropical dry forest in, uh, due to the, the incidence of two hurricanes. We were working in the Chamela Reserve in the coast of Jalisco, also in the foothills of the, of the mountains, where in 2011, we had a, a Jova hurricane, category two, that we thought it, it, it made a horrible uh, change and alteration of the canopy. But four years later, Hurricane Patricia struck the area, and this was the first Category 5 hurricane to hit this part of Mexico in more than a half a century. So only two years, four years apart, these two big disturbances, and they produce this in the landscape that we never seen before. I've been working in this area for 40 years. So what happened? We enforced before that. Uh, in the Chamela Forest that I've been working there, we have long-term uh, data, and we know now that ecosystem processes are strongly controlled by the temporal distribution of rainfall. So that dry season precipitation, because there are years in which we have precipitation during the dry season, is highly correlated with net primary productivity. So our working hypothesis was that water availability will influence the ability of the forest to recover relative to the change experienced during disturbance. What happened? Wind force removed good material from all canopy layers, changing dramatically the distribution of carbon pools. After Hurricane Patricia, as you can see here, the necromass that was uh, uh, produced was four, almost four times higher than the predisturbance condition. So this extraordinary flux of wood debris that went into the forest floor has implications for litter decomposition and uh, nutrient cycling that are under investigation in my group. Resilience of the forest. 
the capacity to return to predisturbance condition as well. Thanks to, to our long-term data, we were able to calculate this index and we found that it was high after Jova, but it declined after Patricia. So what happened? Before, after, after Jova, there was high late season precipitation in Chamela the following years after the impact of the hurricane as I have never seen. So the forests recovered quickly. Also, this Java hurricane was the first after 50 years with moderate forest alteration was category two. And we also observed a vigorous spotting response in the whole forest. But after Patricia, the annual rainfall was 20% below average. It was, they, we had extremely low uh, dry years. So there was a much greater alteration of forest canopy, gap fraction increase and the height of the forest decrease, dull trees disappears. So there is also a cumulative effect of stressful episodes that are challenging the resilience of these ecosystems in the long term. So both events, frost and hurricanes, cause significant alteration of the canopy cover and forest biomass, nutrient sacking at all levels. We published uh, an special issue in forest ecology and management, a collection of 16 papers in which you can see the responses, the resilience and the resistance at the population level, community level, ecosystem level, and it's an interesting uh, uh, publication that we got out from this project. Since these events are predicted to increase in frequency and intensity, of course, we are continuing and we are expanding our monitoring in the Chamela and the Alamos CDFs to analyze the responses and recovery from multiple interacting natural anthropogenic disturbances, but also to understand the legacy effects and the implications for the ecosystem persistence in the long term. So, I am convinced that long term ecological uh, research at ecosystem level is a high priority in the Sky Islands. And as Terwala and uh, in this paper from the Himalaya said, particularly sensitive to climate change, mountains serve as suitable sites for tracing climate-induced biological responses and elevation range shifts and contractions, forest contractions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Angelina. This was wonderful. And uh, I guess a reminder too that as the climate is changing, we're not only not only the hotter conditions that what matters. Um, yeah, yes, freezing temperatures come. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they, it, down, just, and they go down to the subtropical area. And yeah, it's part of the mountains, and so since the forest is connected to the what is happening above, so if it contracts or if it keeps the limits, no, moving the limits. So um, I think it's important to consider as well this vegetation bank. Yeah, I, I wonder what what happened with the last one that hit Texas and uh, you know north northeastern Mexico. Um, that was also pretty pretty rough. Um, well, we we this is totally my fault and we are a bit behind. But I we, you know we should uh, still have some questions, I believe. But uh, I've been failing you today as a moderator. So just let, let's try to be uh, as brief great. as we can. You've been great. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have a, a little bit of time for for Q and A. Torture me <laughs> with one question. <laughs> and remember that you can jump, you don't have to type them in the chat. Um, you can just go for it. I had a question, if I can just talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, it's slowly, Melissa, I, for me to get your question. I had a question about how you calculated uh, your resiliency index. Yeah. I was using the long-term 30 years of data of, uh, and I forget to mention that, litter fall production. And we know that litter fall is an index of net primary productivity. And what I did was to compare the predisturbance condition, the long-term value, and the years before the, the, the hurricane, and the response right after the hurricane, all of the years from, from there to now. So we, we have the whole picture for 35 years, almost 40 years of data, documenting this. And that, that, that was our index of resilience for the primary productivity. We need their phone. Great, thank you. Great. Yeah. 
Thanks. We are measuring this in watersheds, in five water, small watersheds with lots of little traps. We have been collecting them continuously, monthly, since 1982 in different sites and slope aspects and elevation in the, within the watershed. So we have a lot of data. And we can play no, around with this data as well. <laughs> That's good to have long-term data. Um, Kansi says, amazingly comprehensive work. Angelina, it was interesting to see the elevational tre uh, threshold for the frost effects. With the hurricanes, uh, has there been an investigation of mediating effects of slope aspects like topography and that kind of stuff? Well, we have, we, in, this, in this paper, we also measure, in the paper of the global change biology, we present the effect of eastness as well. Mm. But the most important thing here was elevation in the effect of the frost. And what happened is that this cold air coming down pours and sink into the lowlands. So it passed more quickly in the upper parts of the mountain and it poured down into the lowlands and it killed everything. So everything that was there was amazingly, uh, the extension of the, of the effect was amazing to see. It was like apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. and, but and, yes, oh, and, yeah. I, and also in this special issue in forest ecology and management of the Chamela uh, uh, project, there are so, some papers analyzing the slope aspect in the effect of the, of the hurricanes. And we found because of the direction of the winds of the Patricia, that the southern, the southwest facing slope were more protected than the north facing slopes. And we have very different amount of debris falling in different slopes. And that's a paper as well as in preparation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Someone is asking for a link to some for a collection of these papers. I think I do have it. Okay. Yes, sure, of course. I can I can send you the the, the everything. It's it's forest ecology and management, and it's an special issue on resilience of tropical dry forests, uh, neotropical dry forests, and it was published in two thousand eighteen. Okay. And if you look, my name is there, the, the, but I can send you the papers, my name is ResearchGate, and we can share through ResearchGate the papers you are interested. But I can send you the editorial that I wrote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, we, uh, David, just a really interesting talk. Uh, Helena, in the Alamo study, are there woody plants in TDA, in the tropical dry forests that are also found in cooler ecosystems, and do you know if they respond differently to the cold temperature event in 2011? Wow, uh, they, they're in Alamos or in the San Javier Sierra. The, the forest is just there getting into the oak, oaklands. But no, 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 most of the species are very uh, sensitive to, to cold temperatures. So even in the San Javier area, which is at 900 uh, meters above sea level, the, as well, this frost impacted the forest and also all of the poor tropical, so they are from tropical origin, no? all of the plants. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not, maybe there is adaptation at this latitude of, forest, of some species standing more freezing temperatures for more time than others. So the sensitivity is not equal. So in our study as well, since we documented 26,000 stems, we know that Exact uh, taxonomic, we know the name of the species, so now we are preparing a paper for understanding the differences among the different species, the sensitivity to this frost in the animals. We Thank have you. like four species with lots of information for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, but one important yeah. thing, just to finish, the secondary forest was completely eradicated from the earth. So we are saying that it's setting back the clock of sec secondary succession in this area. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've, probably uh, most of the Mexicans here can relate if, if we have moved to the US to, to the, the hardness of, of frost. Um, Okay, well, we need to move into our breakout session. So here you have the, the links. So uh, please go to the one corresponding to you. And uh, we, after that, we'll have a report out session. And uh, we want it to be a more participative uh, uh, session at the, being the last one. So we'll all be jumping uh, with, with some comments. And then at the end, we need to leave some time for our closing remarks from uh, Robert. So um, see you in a bit. Well, welcome back. Uh, so,
so group one, what's up with you? Hey, um, yeah, well, thanks everyone. And this group was uh, Angelina, Dakota, um, Fabio and Chansey and myself. And some of the things we talked about was, uh, and Helena mentioned, um, lithium mines in Northern Mexico as being a major threat, especially to, you know, areas that are not um, currently protected or have plans to be protected. Certainly in, in Southern Arizona and Arizona, uh, New Mexico, um, copper mines, you know, mining is certainly a major threat to the Skyland region. Um, we also discuss like the importance of sort of like really like the public sort of perception and understanding of the value of these ecosystems. And one of the things that, you know, we discussed was like, um, and I work with some economists that do things like ecosystem valuation, but um, especially in Southern Arizona, lots of, um, of recreation that occurs throughout the skylands, largely on, on public lands, um, bird watching, you know, it's a major bird watching destination. So just understanding like the, the, quanti the dollar amount um, that is sort of provided to the region from the sort of biodiversity of these skylands could be really useful in, uh, in advocating for conservation. Um, other things we talked about was sort of thinking about, you know, lots of things going on, fires, uh, droughts, hotter droughts, uh, some of the other things we didn't talk about, grazing, and how, you know, sort of, yeah, there are these global change, climate, you know, global scale climate drivers that are certainly impacting the region, um, but those aren't necessarily, you know, how do we sort of manage those on a local scale, thinking about, you know, reducing fire loads, um, grazing, mitigating invasive buffalo grass, things like that are some of the, the, the things that we could, you know, that seem sort of actionable from a, a local level management approach. Um, I think that's mostly it that we talked about. Thank you, Robbie. Um, group two with John. I think I had group two. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, I have the wrong order there right now. Sorry, Francisca. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so our, our group was uh, Robert Anderson, Bethany Johnson, and Edmundo Gonzalez. And so we kind of went sort of big scale. Um, and Robert was started off with talking about how, you know, there's all these new drivers that keep popping up that are concert that new threats or drivers of change uh, in this, you know, globally. And he was wondering how um, how much do these different drivers vary across uh, different regions or ecosystems? And it would be really cool to look at some commonalities of some of these drivers across, say, a latitude uh, on a global scale. And would the ranking of some of the most important drivers of, of conservation concern or driving big change or threats, would that change or stay consistent across these these uh, at these larger scales? Um, and so, and we were, he, we document talked about how we really don't, we really don't know much about all these different drivers on diff, at different, in different regions. And Edmundo suggested, uh, you know, similar to what Robbie's group was talking about is that, you know, to focus on, you know, some of these regional challenges, he suggested creating a team or, or regional task force that was interdisciplinary to focus on some of these, these policy, you know, these issues on the ground, bringing together scientists, policymakers, um, land managers um, to start to investigate and, and discuss what those priorities for conservation are and where do we invest money if there is any towards those. And Bethany mentioned that one of the biggest challenges was um, getting people to agree on what those priorities are, uh, what, what those action items would be for conservation. And if anybody, if I missed anything, please chime in if you have any other comments to add. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Um, all right, group three uh, with Brooks. Yeah. Um, so some similar themes, I think. We talked about um, just the challenges of, of scale, um, you know, local versus regional versus continental scale, you know, the, the sort of drivers of, of change and different effects um, and how it, it's not always easy um, or it's maybe it's always difficult is the better way to phrase it uh, to sort of, um, yeah, scale those things up um, or down. 
And then that also is just sort of a practical challenge when it comes to implementing management and conservation practices. Um, and then we had, um, we discussed quite a bit, um, it's kind of a similar thing, I think, um, in sort of scaling what you focus on in terms of the, the focal um, units almost. So like individual species or ecosystem functions that you're trying to conserve. Um, you know, there, there's been a real push for functional diversity and phylogenetic um, diversity types of studies in recent years. Um, but that sort of by default takes the emph emphasis off of specific species that, you know, we may know are in um, peril and how do we sort of bring those things together to um, identify conservation needs. We didn't have many answers really, but these are some of the challenges I guess we identified. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, group four with uh, Nathan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we had Alberto, Alicia, Dave, Gonzalo, Jorge, and Rachel, myself. And we were first trying to think about just the challenges broadly um, to conservation in the Sky Islands. This idea of the, the changing vegetation template that we're now observing, how does that impact the biota, land use change, climate change. But we really kind of keyed in on this idea that the Sky Islands are, are fairly small in area and, fra and you know, fragmented by their nature. And so this idea of small range sizes really making all the, and, and population sizes kind of lending uh, greater risk towards stochastic events like fire. And so that like one of the, the chief concerns for conservation should be like trying to figure out how to um, how to mitigate those small range sizes. We can also kind of in turn use this as a, as a tool of, okay, maybe the Sky Islands are kind of a barometer for change. This was um, for uh, Dave Brashear's terminology, which I think is pretty good. Um, this, this idea of an early warning system for, for broader terrestrial change. And that actually, you know, if we start to really bring down emissions, say in the United States, we might be able to uh, detect practical changes in the Sky Island system once the, those uh, emissions drop. And so that could be kind of a reinforcement of these, these policies could actually have a positive change. But that like current, we don't currently have any kind of standardized indicators or regular monitoring efforts across the Sky Islands. So that's, that's a pretty big challenge that um, a group like this could try and work towards. Is there anything else that I, I missed the last minute of our group, so. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, group five with Erica. Yeah, so um, as usual, I think a lot of things that were um, said in my group were addressed by the other ones, especially in terms of, you know, having these systems that are somewhat disconnected or fragmented and thinking about how this is dynamic, their connectivity might you know, change over time historically. Um, but one of the things that did come up that was quite different from what everyone else said was thinking of the practical terms of how practitioners and like government support might vary across the system on either side of the border because of the system that is um, crosses borders and how this might be increasingly difficult with, um, you know, so when you have other social problems that might make it even harder, you know, so, um, for example, the problems with the cartels or, you know, the whole border wall situation going on at the moment, how that might actually make uh, the conservation, uh, like the practical side of conservation harder. And um, I guess the other part was like, well, how do we address um, the needs of practitioners to prioritize our research in terms of those needs uh, was something that also came up in my group. Thanks, Erika. Uh, I was with group, group six uh, in, in Spanish and um, I guess the two main takeaways were related to, well, first one thing was that the, uh, the challenge of doing ecosystem psychology research from a perspective of disturbance, right? Disturbances because, uh, well, just in general, but because of how, how, how is it that we need really long-term data and long-term studies to understand, you know, how really ecosystems are responding and how different species might be responding. And, uh, and one of the things we were discussing was that um, perhaps, you know, one way trying to, we learned in the past weeks, you know, a lot of uh, other uh, approaches like uh, genetic and molecular approaches and then paleoecology and paleobiology and how to 
maybe integrating groups that have all these different expertises so that we can understand change in the long term, uh, um, especially related to climate and disturbances might actually give us a clue so that ecosystem, anything related to management and conservation has at least the, you know, the best possible quality of information behind it. And then we, we actually had someone from CONAMP uh, and in a group, and that was great because uh, I guess one of the, another of the conclusions was that as researchers and myself having worked at CONAMP some years ago, I guess the petition is to like, please, please share your research back uh, in different ways with, uh, with, with CONAMP staff and with the people that are on the ground and try to seek for uh, opportunities to, to talk to them. Um, you know, uh, right after the research is produced and you have the results. That, that is really key to try to link these two things. And we, I think we forget about how much that not, doesn't happen. Um, so so that, is, that is something to, to highlight. Um, with that, actually, I wanna uh, remind you that we at Scan Alliance, we're trying to uh, put this effort around parks in, uh, across the border, at least in Arizona and Southern California of uh, uh, clusters of researchers that are directly connected to the staff of these parks. And we'll be working on that in uh, this following year. So if you are interested, if you're working in the region and you're interested, please feel free to reach out um, so that we can uh, count with you. Um, all right, well, we are moving into the, our final 10 minutes. And um, uh, so for this, uh, we wanted to, to do it a little bit different this time. And it would be great if uh, some of the speakers, either not necessarily from today, but you know, from any of the weeks, if some of the speakers can share some of your uh, final ideas, some of your final thoughts uh, on this. And, um, and then let's try to be brief too, like, like try to keep it under a minute or so. We, uh, at the end, we're gonna have Robert Anderson also uh, uh, with, uh, with one or two minutes of um, exiting words. So please go ahead if you have anything that, that you'd like to share. Just quickly, I really like what you say about uh, bringing the results to back to CONAMP or to any conservation agencies or NGOs. And I think that's uh, one of the main home take home messages I, I, I have with me is that there is a lot of research that colleagues are doing and I wasn't aware of, and it's great, um, but there is, if, if I don't know this research and I'm in the field and really chasing for papers, then people who is very busy doing things on the field are not going to have the time or the capability to go and look for, for these papers. So uh, my take home message will be to do more exercises like this, where we can explain our findings to conservation agencies and NGOs. And I congratulate also the organizers for this effort. I learned a lot, I had a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to what's next. Now, thank you. Gracias, Alicia. Well, as, as you mentioned, long-term monitoring is fundamental. And uh, I, I, I as well, it was amazing uh, in sessions, learning uh, me as well. And I can see that there are squirrels and mal, uh, animals and different parts of bits and here and there of the understanding of what is going on in the Sky Islands, but we need to integrate this information. What we know about ecosystem processes at the community level, at the population level, at the molecular level. So is, are we able like, to link all these pieces together, like to have an, a, a, a broad perspective of what is going on now? or the changes we have been detecting as, as I show you in the PDF along the Pacific coast of Mexico. So these systems are very fragile. And as you were mentioning, the fragmentation and isolated make them very vulnerable to what is happening now, no? Climate change and climate change. So, but is there uh, in your experience uh, already a paper in which all the information is like put together to integrate what we know about these systems? I think that would be a good addition. Thank you. And thank you for putting together this amazing symposium or workshop or event. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, and um, I, I can't see everyone's uh, screen. So if you, if you are doing the raise your hand thing, so maybe don't, maybe just uh, say something. Uh, Aya Vasquez had her hand up a moment ago. I, okay. I now that you gave me uh, permission, I will. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm, I'm, I joined the congratulations to from uh, for everyone involved. Thank you very much. And I will just add something that might be very obvious, but is not in practice. That this research, all research, but this this um, framework we we have here needs the collaboration from many people, many instances, many universities, many fields of expertise. So uh, we do really have to keep on working in collaboration between USA, Mexico, and uh, far beyond. Um, and to do it in, in the, the best of equal uh, circumstances and, um, and rewards. And this is a great proof of that, that uh, we are, doing, trying to do that and do it in the best way. That'll be it. Congratulations again. Yeah, congrats to you all. Thank you, Ella. Well, if I may add that uh, what Angelina was just saying and, and, uh, and then about, the, about sharing the results with, with uh, agencies like Conamp, I think we, we actually have an opportunity that getting long-term research done and having an, an institution as capable, which uh, as CONAMP, that you know, it's it's a bit in a drought right now. Talking about drought, and I think that th this is a moment where we, uh, the researchers, also have the opportunity of of working with CONAMP to set these long term places. They're there, and and you know, they're always happy to collaborate and facilitate a lot of different things. And this is probably a good time to bring some of the your own resources to get that research done. Um, so that synergy, uh, it's, it's there evident, and I would just encourage everyone to, to try to, you know, with the, where if you do, if you work in uh, Western Central Mexico or in the Skylands over here or, or closer to the Gulf of Mexico, go and look for the, the parks and the areas and the staff that is working there and, and seek ways of, of supporting each other. That might be a good key for long-term ecological research, actually. Um, yeah, th thank you for organizing this awesome group of people. Everyone's really welcoming. Um, I guess the, the, the main thing that uh, occurs to me is that there's sort of this two side of like the long term ecological research, but then bringing in the historical side mm -hmm. and to really establish baselines for change that ultimately like it should be done on some sort of a, a systematic basis across all the taxa from plants to insects to um, vertebrates, invertebrates. Yeah, so like, I guess I just um, kind of coming into the system newly within the last you know year or so thinking about Sky Island diversity and wanting to find really these historical baseline studies or data, it's not readily available necessarily. So um, I think that would be kind of important for us to demonstrate the types of dynamics that we Kind of know are happening but that um, are sometimes hard to demonstrate and that maybe like a, a systematic effort by a group like this would would be a good way forward it sounds like maybe in you know future gatherings like these ones which i really hope that we do uh we might also want to start and, and we talked about this but you know someone mentioned today about like valuation efforts and you know talking more about the economics and the, and the social um science side of some of these things that might look different than what we're doing right now, but maybe we can we can make some efforts towards um, bringing those guys in. Robert, um, you want to go? Yes. Um, so um, I guess I want to try to get some thank yous before I forget the big groups, um, but I know I'm going to forget some things. Uh, first, to the the people at Arizona who had such uh, amazing technical uh, logistics. Um, then moving on to programming, especially to Erica Johnson and Robbie Berger, who did so much in, in selecting, inviting speakers, and then quite a lot of personal <laughs> personnel <laughs> logistics. Um, thank you for you guys. And Quadra, uh, Paulo, you were just the perfect moderator. Um, so who, whoever found you um, gets a lot of credit. Um, and, um, you know, we were originally uh, in this grant thinking of a working group, a very small working group, and then we couldn't have people in person. So um, Robbie started talking to Arizona and this ended up being, you know, a far grander experience than we ever imagined. Um, so overall, um, you know, we hope this has 
sparked, you know, and catalyzed a lot of um, future research. So we've definitely shared a lot of research ideas. Um, everyone has learned things. We hope this ends up um, catalyzing a lot of individual groups um, that go off and do things. The speakers uh, will be um, kind of reviewing notes and thinking of, you know, what is whether there is kind of a like a conference proceedings or a horizons of the field uh, type paper that we might um, that we might write. Um, or not, um, but anyway, I'm doing some thinking afterwards. And I'm trying to think what other things, the other thing that I would like to end with is I was really struck of the possible role of NGOs of um, being facilitators to bridge between academics and management agencies. And this um, workshop has been overwhelmingly attended by people doing research uh, from more of an academic setting. Um, and so I think perhaps the next step might be something that is um, very much driven by um, management needs. Um, and I would also, you know, quite envious of people working in um, the, the borderland system, that they have something uh, like Paula's organization um, to be facilitating this uh, translation um, and, um, you know, exchange of information about the needs and the science. Um, I, you know, I, I wish there was something like that um, in, for every Sky Island system. Um, so congratulations. And, you know, I think this is something to be looking for wherever we're working, you know, who might help um, bridge um, to those other um, um, groups of people that are really making the decisions. So unless there's anything else um, that Erica, Robbie, Paolo, or any other organizers um, would like to say, then um, just a thank you to everyone for participating. So many more people than we had imagined. So thank you. Thank you so Everyone. much for having us here today. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Robbie, Paulo. I enjoyed it. Gracias being a todo you. mundo. Sí, okay. gracias. Cuídense mucho. Gracias. Chao. Bye bye. Chao, chao. Chao, chao. Un gusto. Bye.